Amira, you do a lot of media and you're really good at it. So we're not only delighted to have you in the Expert Women's Database, but I really appreciate you taking the time right now to share some of your prep preparation tips with us. Um, did you have any formal media training before you started doing interviews? So I had a lot of experience behind the microphone as a journalist, actually. Oh. I spent many years um, working at CBC Radio here in Ottawa. I studied journalism at Carleton. Uh, so I actually had never anticipated that one day I'd be on the other side of the questioner. Um, and I think somehow that did prepare me uh, in the sense of I remember what a good interview would sound like, you know, when I'd listen to Ottawa Morning or on the day after booking a guest. Um, and so I think that definitely let me think about, okay, how am I going to present my information in a way that will be interesting to a listener? Uh, and so I think that was probably the best preparation I could hope for. And so could you sum up in just a few words what is the, what are the ideal qualities of a, of a good interview subject? I think to be able to tell a story and to really be able to sort of share a little bit of your own personality somehow, uh, that's sometimes difficult, especially if the subject matter is a little heavy or uh, you yourself are trying to present information without necessarily being part of the story. So for instance, if I have to sort of give a, a bit of a feeling of you know, how our Muslim community is doing after some incidents occurred, um, I want to sort of try to be a, a little bit of a detached observer um, sharing my feelings. But at the same time, I know that by demonstrating that my own human side, that that will help the audience uh, try to relate maybe but better to me. And so you get called by CTV or CBC and you agree to do an interview. What's your process? Walk us through what you do in preparation for being on television and radio. Well, it typically takes at least an hour or so of really sitting down and thinking about what my message is, if I have that luxury. Not always possible. Uh, but when I do, I sit down, um, I think about, you know, what are they inviting me to speak about. Um, in the, sometimes you have a pre-interview with the producer, which gives you a sense of the kinds of questions that they're looking for. So that will, of course, help inform me. Um, but then I think, okay, what do I want to make sure that I get across? So I create what I, you know, the talking points, the key messages that I want to be thinking about. Um, I write them down, I practice them to myself, or if I have a friend or colleague that I can practice with. Um, and quite often I'm driving downtown to the interview, I'll be, you know, doing a mock interview back and forth with myself in the car, and I'm sure that, you know, drivers going by think I'm, you know, well, now you probably think I'm just talking on the phone. Yeah. But in previous times, they just think, okay, she's lost it. Well, and the truth is, being able to say the words out loud does make a difference. I certainly find that. If it's just in my head, then when I put my mouth in gear, I get halfway through a sentence and think, oh, I could have been way more succinct if I had said it this way instead. Absolutely. When I teach op-ed writing, I encourage people to write at the top of the page, hi, Dad as a means of getting them into a voice that is not that sort of expert authority speaking to her academic colleagues. Uh, is that something that you also have to work on, keeping your language really accessible? Absolutely. So it's really important that you imagine talking to either your parent or a friend um, and try to keep that uh, the messaging really simple and, and you know keep it as simple as possible um, and keep it limited to you know maybe two or three key messages because otherwise you know as we're going to say five to seven minutes in an interview you want to make sure that that listener really has taken away what you really wanted to say versus getting lost in you know a bunch of very smart things that you have to say but it may sort of uh, water down the key the key message that you want them to have. I think so many people going into an interview, especially if they haven't done it very often, they feel like, okay, my job is to sit there and wait for the questions, and then I'm going to respond to the questions. And the notion of having an agenda or some key points, as you say in advance, is, is a critically important thing. When we spoke, and I noticed this in watching some of your interviews, you use a lot of analogies, which is one way to make what you're talking about, the con conceptual things, vivid and visual. Do you have to work at those or do they come naturally for you? Um, I definitely have to work at them and sort of as I do more and more interviews, especially if it's on similar topics, you start to almost develop like your roster of analogies, even on interviewing. 
uh, my analogy about that is when you go into an interview, you have so much to say. It's as though you've got a bunch of horses and they all want to get out the one door at the same time. And that's how I describe trying to pick and choose which thought you're going to share at that moment to that question. Okay, and so how do you do that? How do you decide which horse in the moment you should let it Yeah, you, you basically have to try to go with your strongest horse, essentially. You really have to decide, you know, um, it, it's, it's difficult because you have to balance, right? You are trying to get your messaging across, but you also want to be listening to what the questioner is saying because you don't want to sort of sound, um, you know, too tone deaf or you don't want to sound too rehearsed because you won't be invited back. They, you know, definitely shows want to feel that there's a bit more of a dynamic. And so while you're practiced and you know what you want to say, you also need to be attuned to what the questioner is saying. Are you ever in a position where you're actively looking for a way to bridge from the question to, to your key message where you actually don't want to go in the direction that the interviewer is taking you? Absolutely, like it frequently will happen where, um, you know, for instance, whenever I talk about human rights issues or Muslim communities specifically, um, I'm always trying to find the positive to be sharing with listeners or an audience members or viewers um, so that, you know, maybe we're talking about a hate crime, maybe we're talking about a terrorist incident. Um, but I need to make sure that uh, the audience member who's listening is not coming away with Muslims are nothing but trouble. Right? Whether, even if we're the victims of a hate crime, at the end of the day, it's like, why are we hearing about Muslims all the time? So it's very important for me to try to talk about the contributions that Muslims, just like any other community member, is, is making to Canada, and try to keep it positive. So even though it may be a bleak subject matter, I'm always hoping to find some way to bridge it to talking about, despite the difficulties, you know, we continue to contribute, we continue to try to make positive advances for everyone. One of the things you also mentioned when we spoke on the phone was the, um, I forget how you put it, you said something about placing yourself in an issue to maybe humanize it or make it something more relatable. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So I, again, I, I choose that very selectively when I put myself in the story necessarily because um, again, at times you want to sort of provide an analysis and you want people to see you not necessarily as being spoken to just because you happen to be Muslim, but because you actually have information that's important. But I was recently talking about an article that I had co-written with uh, another advocate about Steve Bannon being invited to the monk debates, for instance. Um, and the interviewer, you know, he, it was interesting because he kept saying, well, I'm on your side, I'm on your side, but uh, what about free speech? What, you know, why can't we just let Mr. Bannon say what he wants? Um, and I wasn't getting to him until the moment where I said, look, when someone like Steve Bannon has these platforms, at the end of the day, they put people like me wearing a headscarf, visibly Muslim, at risk of a hate crime. So how far do you want to go? Do you want to sacrifice me at the altar of free speech? And you know, he couldn't say anything after that. He was like, you're right, I don't. And that's how we ended the interview. So at that point, I was definitely placed in the position where I had to make it about you know, me as a human being on this line with the, with the interviewer and the host, uh, so that hopefully the listener can try to imagine what that feels like. That, that is a very powerful way to, to engage somebody in thinking about it on an individual human level, yes. as opposed to the sort of principle of free speech, which is, is great in, in theory, but in practice sure. has all yeah. sorts of implications. That's right. Yeah. Um, we know that concrete stories and examples have um, more impact or more memorable illicit emotion than data alone, but sometimes it's important to also share statistics. Uh, how do you go about including data and stats in, in your interviews? Again, it's one of those delicate dances where um, ideally you will have you know, a specific story that will be able to tell the story of the data. So for instance, if I'm talking about you know, young children who are now too afraid to admit that they're Muslim or don't want their parents to come to school, um, I'll talk about you know, seeing that firsthand within my own community, but I'll say that you know, there's at least one study that demonstrates that up to a third of Muslim children in America uh, really are afraid to admit that they're Muslim at this time. So it reinforces that it's not only an anecdote, but that, that this is also a trend. So trying to find that way to, to tell that story. Anything else that occurs to you that uh, would be useful for, for beginner interview subjects to 
to know in advance of an interview? I think what's so critical is practice, practice, practice. And so when I first started out um, as a human rights advocate, I used to often uh, jump at any opportunity to talk to community radio, um, simply because you don't feel necessarily the stakes are as high. You're not on national television, per se. And I found that by doing that, um, that sort of gave me the confidence to eventually uh, do those, you know, the larger audiences. So I think that it is important to, to think about practicing, to know that, um, you know, you see someone on television who looks super polished, that doesn't happen overnight. Um, but it does take a lot of training and a lot of thinking. Um, and mistakes are made, and that's okay. But uh, it's very important to get out there. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks very much.